Whoa, got a full house in here. Happy Monday, everybody. I don't know if I I feel like. This may be the most people I feel like I've had at the start of a chat, at least by myself. Hey, Ian. Hey, Caverna. Hey, Gashrin. Mr. Hobbs, welcome. Uh, Frederick Orr says they like Cairn more than Glog. I kind of think of them as different animals. But, uh, hey, every, everyone, I'm a big fan of of, of, of Cairn. I had Yohai Gal on here ages ago. Maybe I'll try to see if I can get him on for another another conversation at some point. But I did see, hey, and Yohai, whoa, look at that. And the man himself is here. Exactly. Why choose? Play them all. Um, so this was posted, uh, or at least I saw it this morning. And this is a sip of, at this point, kind of lukewarm cappuccino for the working man. This was posted to Mastodon. I don't know what's happening with Twitter. <laughs> it seems like there's bad news about the platform all the time. But it's still running. So I'm still on there. But I'm also on Mastodon. I'm also trying out something else. A couple other things, actually. But there's a there's going to be a goodly amount of folks on Mastodon, though. I have not done a good job finding everybody. However, I did find this. And this is a, I guess, a a setting creation document, helper, guide, if you will. <laughs> Adam says, if you say, say his name three times, he just appears. Well, let's let's say his name and not say, you know, Candyman. Uh, I think I've got this format. It's a little bit weird the way that the screen sharing works. If I, if I, on my screen, I actually have to kind of squeeze into it so that I, my, it doesn't, there's some weird things with the display, but I think I got it kind of centered. Let me know if, if folks can't see it. And I tried to kind of shrink myself and move myself to stay mostly out of the way of the content. So apologies, but there is the links to this bad boy are in the, in the show notes. And if you follow Yochai on uh, Mastodon, you can also see it there. So let's get into it. I'm not sure how long this is going to take. So we can happy to talk about other stuff afterwards. Sometimes things take longer than I think. And sometimes they're shorter than I think. <laughs> handyman or candyman I, I you know mr hobbs i could use a handyman for multiple things so if i could say handyman three times so i could show up that would be great but there's actually a i don't know if your people are aware of this so much if you don't need them i mean that's good because everything's running smoothly but there really is a shortage of crafts people trades people for lots of stuff um and it's annoying and frustrating and it's uh it's sad that people don't find these lines of work i guess appealing in a way to draw them in because you can, there's, there's, there's money to be made. Money to be made if you can use your hands and use some tools and, and get out there. Ian says they're following everyone on Mastodon right now. Awesome. All right. Without further ado, four people start to bail out and think, what is this? I joined, I joined to read about setting and Karen, and instead I'm getting handyman, candyman lore. Lore? I don't know. Advice? I don't know. All right, so here we are. It, this is under, so if you go to cairnrpg.com, C-A-I-R-N-R-P-G.com, forward slash W-I-P, forward slash 2-E, forward slash setting, forward slash, you will end up here. Just to cover all my bases, I'll throw this in the chat as well so that we can make sure if you're in the chat, want to follow along at home. Let's say, and I'll pop this up. There it is. Go here find it summary a setting has a theme terrain details and factions and then we have an example setting which i'll open up in another page which we won't go to quite yet but we'll check this out afterwards distance is measure measured in watches assuming the party travels by foot and on maintained roads theme establish facts about the setting good questions to answer how does magic work what level of technology do the denizens have how does religion function? Do gods walk the lands? And do the people know it? Who are the PCs in the setting? What is their position with respect to those in power? What, are, what species and backgrounds exist? And are they playable by the PCs? What linguistic and cultural flavor exists in the setting? These are all good questions. And of course, if you're not, whatever setting, whatever mechanics you're using, you'll probably want to make sure that you pick a mechanics that you can hack or easily tweak to fit whatever you're doing. So if you're using a a system that has tons of magic in it, but then you decide this is a low or no magic setting, you'll want to figure that stuff out. These are also great things that you can ask as part of your session zero or session minus one. I think I talked about it in my game where we had sort of a campaign pitching session. So we all knew we were going to play, but we didn't know 
you know, what we were going to play. So I brought it out of the table and, and we just had kind of, I wouldn't even have called, I mean, we probably could have just called a part of session zero. I didn't really name the sessions, but it was definitely a pre actually gaming session, pre character creation talking about, well, what kind of session do we want? And this is something you can have the players have some input. Maybe you're going to find out something that's interesting. Maybe you were thinking, oh, everyone's going to want kind of a, say, Forgotten Realm style high magic. And then you're going to actually talk to the players and get them together. And they're actually going to say, well, you know what? Actually, I'd like to play in a more gritty low magic setting or vice versa. You think, oh, yeah, everyone's going to want kind of a gritty low magic thing. And people are like, no, really, I want something more gonzo fun, Harry Potter style magic, whatever. Those are good questions to have. Technology level, I think, is a really interesting question to ask, too. And I, I, I love the question. I'm always someone's wondered because that's something I always remember from GURPS. I haven't looked at a GURPS book in probably 20 plus years, probably 30, probably 30 years. Uh, so, but one of the things I always took away from GURPS was these, this idea of the tech level. And you could have all these, uh, the, one of the, I think it's maybe it's the dream of everybody who plays GURPS and hopefully people who have actively played GURPS in the last 30 years have been able to achieve this is having, the, having the ability to have different tech levels in your game so you can have the, cavemen meeting up with i don't know high medieval people or meeting up with even spacemen and i know they in D and stuff we you know there's different ways to simulate that but i always love the idea of the tech level but then when you get into the nitty gritty of it i always felt like i never found a, a satisfactory way to really try to express that so you know the idea of ooh, what if some bronze age warriors rolled up on some medieval knights or samurai and kind of how would how would the how would their different you know uh, Technology, different materials affect each other. Bronze versus steel versus iron versus whatever. I could never figure it out. But I, I love, I, I just love that idea of the, I've always loved in RPGs that level of the technology. Oh, uh, yeah. I didn't just notice in the chat, man, I got to do everything myself. Let's see. I don't think I can, can I hide it? Yeah. Hopefully Nightbot, and plus they were all caps too. Nightbot is supposed to have. to have uh, all caps protection but they're not well you know what i need to do is i need to give some folks powers powers of admin in the chat if you want to if you are someone who is in here often enough and would like to have the power to the power to drop the hammer on spammers let me know because I, I don't have anybody right now and i'm on this my thing my kind of chat interface with my stream isn't youtube so i can't directly mess with it as i'm going so i love the technology question religion always a good question to ask chris says make somebody mod yeah that's what I, that's what i meant yes that's my roundabout way of saying if anybody's in here often enough and feels like taking on mod responsibilities dm me message me on some platform and we'll we'll figure it out Project says this is the only day that we could probably make it I, i'm not expecting I, i'm thinking out i'm gonna try my goal is to try to stream every day this week but with Christmas fast approaching, plans of mice and men and all that. So we'll, we will see how that happens, how that works out. Religion, another great question. I really also love the idea of gods walking the lands. We don't use that enough. I feel like in a lot of games, the gods are so far absent. I mean, when they're not the dead gods that are the trope of the dead gods who's being da-da-da-da, you know, if it's not that, then they, they tend to be in far off lands doing far off things. But I just like the prompt because it encourages people to think about, hey, what if the gods are really walking around kind of, Trojan War style. What if they're down there, like literally walking the battlefield invisibly, tweaking things here or there, as is their want? Who are the PCs in the setting? Also a great question. What is their position to respect with respect to those in power? A great question. What species and backgrounds exist? Excellent question. And are they playable? Yeah, definitely the playable part. So I think that seems to be more and more, and people can uh, forgive or correct me, but I feel like in the OSR these days, human only is kind of becoming the sort of norm, which is interesting because it's very much not that in 5th edition, but I think at least from what I'm reading on Reddit, I think I see a lot of stuff that's kind of human-centric campaigns. I suppose Gygax will be happy in his grave because I think that was his his want, and he has seen it, seeing it come to pass in some degree. <laughs> Mr. Hobbs says, I hope it doesn't end the same as of mice and men. Yeah, let's hope not. On to provinces. Oh, wait a minute. Did I skip something? No. 
Oh, and then linguistic and that stuff's really good. Come up with a couple of bullet points. And, and I think for these, and I, you know, one of the things I was thinking about with this is given that the Dungeon 23 stuff starting off, when you're doing these in an in a exercise such as this or in something like Dungeon 23 or Gygax 70, uh, what was it, 76 or whatever, um, just get a couple of bullet points. You don't need to write a whole paragraph. Don't feel like you need to write a short story. Just a couple sentences. And use, especially on the GM side, use those earthly analogs to your advantage. Don't necessarily need to pitch them to your players like that, but if it helps you to think about it like, uh, well, this is King Arthur meets the ancient Assyrians, something like that, and that helps focus it in your mind, just you know, drop that in there, and then you can be more, you can then come back and revisit it and make it nicer and, and, and more independent of, you know, earthly things later on. Uh, Yokai says there's an example of the finish setting using the system linked at the top. I got it. Yep, I got it, Yokai. I'm going to try to hit that afterwards. We're going to go through it, and then we'll go through your thing, and I even might try to do, I did watch, though, Yokai also has a video about this kind of mapping system that I watched about six minutes long. Right now it's in, like, Google Photo something. I don't know if he's going to put it on. Yohai, you can let me know if you're going to put that on YouTube or wherever it is. And, and I was thinking, depending on time, maybe I'll try to do that here. Um, or at least we can look. At least, at least I, I watch it so I have the idea in my mind. If we read through it and it seems a little bit confusing, I did watch it. So hopefully I may be able to, um, might be able to uh, work through it a bit. On the provinces. A province is a single traversable landscape roughly defined by divisible terrain, mountain ranges, rivers, and oceans. A domain is one or more adjacent provinces defined by the same ruler. Each province has a heart, a settlement of any size that reflects the history, factions, and peoples of the land. I think this is a great way to do it. And I was actually thinking about that because I don't think, looking at the the sort of point-based mapping that Yohai did for this, it's not hex-based. And I was automatically thinking like, ooh, how can I kind of tweak this to be Hex based. And something that I'm thinking about even beyond that was that I was wondering if mountains, at least the peaks and rivers, should not really be hex borders and not go through the middles of hexes because, like he's saying here, they really are their borders. They are they are barriers. And I was thinking about that as having, you know, the my mountain ranges, the peaks anyway, following the lines of the hex, because it makes sense that the hexes are really there as a shorthand for for marking off a certain area of land and saying kind of this is a thing right? where we call it a province whether we call it a hex whatever like this is a kind of a unit and how do you really make those you know how do you really call out those is often at least you're starting them in terms of these kind of real borders now sometimes you're not going to have that you're gonna have five hexes of woods whatever but often in terms of when we're demarking territory we're looking for those hard boundaries and rivers and mountains tend to be those hard boundaries this is all good and i like the idea of the heart of the province the heart of the ghostbusters ladies and gentlemen and then we have a scale we have a small province that has a heart that is no more than four watches from the furthest detail and I'm, we're gonna i'm sure see the definitions of these coming on a medium province has a heart no more than eight watches from the furthest detail and a large province has a heart that's no more than 16 watches from the furthest detail so basically i'm guessing a detail would be some sort of um, point of interest that's considered part of that province. So the further they are, obviously, the further they are, further they are away from that, not necessarily the physical center of the province, but the talking about here, the cultural, historical part of it, obviously, the bigger the province is going to be. <laughs> Eric says they've heard about fungible hexes. Yes, everything's fungible. We're all fungible here. Oh, on onto creating a province. Now here is where the video comes in. Let me see if I can. I don't know if I can do this properly. I probably can. I, I actually opened up. I got my. I got this here. So maybe I'll try doing this. Let's see if we'll. See if we can get this. Go through the exercise. Let's see. I got the pen. Okay, here we go. I'm going to go back and forth, so apologies for that. On a flat sheet of paper, create a dot to signify the heart of the province. So let's create a dot. Put a dot. Let's... What a horribly ugly dot, but it'll work. Okay. Create three more dots in a triangle with the heart in the rough center. So we can do one here. 
call it one here and then one here. All right, so far so good. Create three more dots in a triangle with the heart in the rough center. Each of these dots represent an additional detail on the map. And what Yohai says in this video is, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna actually turn this, but imagine turning, turning or rotating. So if we had, if we, this was our north, then you know, our, our top, then when we turn this, so now we might put three more dots and have one be, let's see, out here. Another. Remember, we're doing another triangle out here and then out here. I'm not really worrying too much if they're shouldn't be as close to each other or whatever. We're gonna, just going to riff with it because this is what you'd be doing if you were just making one. All right, so now we've got that. Connect two of the dots to the heart using solid lines to represent roads, dotted lines for trails, double solid lines for rivers, and double dotted lines for tunnels. All right, so let's keep track of this. Two. So first we're going to do one. There's going to be a road. All right, so let's do our road first. So let's make our road. There we go. And then we'll make a, let's make a, so this one has to go to the side. We'll make this one the dash, so a trail. I'm not going to worry about tunnels for this purposes with this. So far, so good. Someone let me know if I'm, messing anything up all right where were we so we did that connect the remaining dots to one of the paths crossing it and continuing for a distance all right connect so we connect the two connect the remaining dots so right so i think right it's not the remaining dots but the remaining is it the remaining dots right because we did that create three more oh you know what i connected oh uh, I, I i made the extra i went out of order See, look at that. I went out of order. So my original, that's actually worked. So this one, ooh, so I went out of order. So my apologies for that. I skipped, I skipped doing this part when I should have waited. But that's okay. Cause these are my original three. So what I was supposed to do is just do the original three and then put these up, swing that through. Now I come back and whoops, I loops. Oh, that's the example setting. Now I come back through here. Okay, now I do that. So now here's where I'm supposed to reorder. So apologies. I, it's because I'd watched the video. I was kind of gotten ahead of myself. But you do that. You connect them. And then you make more dots. Now we connect two of the new dots to any path. But do not connect the final dot to anything. All right. So now come back here. And so I've got this one. And I can. There. And let's throw like that. So here we have this interesting symbol. Okay, we did that. We did that. Create a new dot wherever the paths cross and wherever a new path ends. And then we got a number of the dots spanning outwards. So then we're going to come through. So there's something here. Circle here there circle there circle there so we have this guy that's as is to be not connected and then we're supposed to number them so we have one is there is there a setting how is there a way we're supposed to starting from the hat and expanding out okay it doesn't matter let's just go in two I'm using this, I'm doing this with a mouse, so apologies for the horrible numbers. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Ugh. I undo that. That was terrible. Oops. And then 11. There we go. 
Okay, says that what's important is that some paths cross, that the points are made both where they cross and at terminals. Yeah, I think we got that. Oh, didn't mean to do that. Oops. Okay. So there we go. We've got that. Frederick says this could be done already if you just hand the players pencils and pens, have them take turns drawing on the map. You could. I mean, you could totally turn this into a little I don't know, mini game is the right word, but yeah, just a little little part, little bit more of the just shared world building. World building. You can use other shapes, squares, rectangles, circles, etc., to create dots instead. Try varying the distance between dots for each successive province. You can repeat this process for any adjacent provinces, connecting them by road, river, or range. All right, good to know. Now, rolling on the terrain. I'll have to open this up in some other windows. Do that for quickness. Roll on the terrain hub table to determine the heart's terrain. Oh, we have it here too. Okay. Um, do I have dice handy? I do, but they're kind of world away. Let's see if I can get a die out without causing a collapse for all my junk that's piled up. Darn it. Stay still. Let's see what dice I've got here. What kind of dice we need? Just a d6. That should be easy enough to guess. Okay. D6. One of my handy dandy <coughs> D&D uh, Yahtzee D6s. So let's see here. So hub terrain. I got a six. Desert, wasteland, or sea? Desert, wasteland, or sea? What do we like? What do we like here? Desert, wasteland, or sea? Hmm. Sea, interesting. Sea might be interesting. Wasteland would also be interesting. There's kind of stuff here in trail, so maybe sea doesn't make sense. Oh, unless. All right, I'm going to, let's see here. Let's see. Unless this ends up being an island, in which case that might work. If, for example, let's see, we do a coast, kind of comes in. Maybe it's like a. I don't know if that reads as coastline. So Cassic Agency says I'll need a D8 too. Okay, I'll pull out a D8 momentarily. So we got that. Roll on the near near terrain table for the terrain for any dots, two hops or fewer from the heart. So I believe, if I'm remembering this correctly, the two hops are if you're following these trails, what's two what you can get through in two hops or less, which is I think is basically everything except number 11, right? So we can go one, two, and we're number eight. One, two, and we're nine. Yeah, I think all of these. One, two, one, two, one. So yeah, I think everything but number 11 is going to be near terrain. And that is a D8. So let me pull out. Let's find a D8. This might take me a minute. Here we go. All right, actually, that, that didn't take me as long as I thought. Okay, here we go. This is a ooh, VHS die 1985 games. Five. Five is Hills, Canyon, or Mountains. Oh, and I didn't say, I guess I'll just go in order of the numbers. So number two, ah, Hills is good. Hills, Hills, Hills. There we go. Let's do another one for the next one. Two gives us forest, jungle, or swamp. What's next down here? Forest makes sense. I'm just going to. I know this is horrible. Apologies for this terrible looking. Okay, so hopefully we get the idea that's forest. Forest for that one. Let's see. Number three. 
five, we get more hills, canyons, and forests. We could do canyons, maybe. But, uh, I don't know. I think hills. Let's go up with And plus, I just don't... <laughs> I just don't want to try to draw canyons on here. So that's my excuse for sticking with hills. Hills are easy for me to draw in this. Canyons are not. I guess I got to keep rolling five. Stop rolling five. I want something else. One, plains, grassland, and farmlands. Where are we going now? Plains, grassland, and farmlands. That kind of makes sense. I like that. I'll do... Uh, This little things are ugh. All right, now we need another one. Oh, I got a deuce. What does the deuce give me? Deuce, forest, jungles, and swamp again. Number six. Let's see, we haven't. Uh, we'll do some swampiness. We haven't. We haven't. We haven't. We don't have any rivers that we've noted. Maybe there's a lake. Around here, something like that. That's all right. That works. Now we get four hills, canyons, and mountains. But they love some hills, canyons, and mountains. It kind of makes sense. It's in the same area. Maybe I'll make mountains this time. Wait, can I undo that? That was a terrible mountain. That's the color I want to do. I want to click in there. There we go. That's gonna make sense, right? So you have the, I'm liking a bit of the, so you got some hills and you've got then the going into the mountains. <laughs> Brian Smith, hey, Brian Smith says, hills, canyons, and mountains, oh my. Take it easy, Frederick Work. Thanks for joining us for as long as you could. Let's see, where was I at? That was my number seven. I need four more. Number eight is river flooded or oasis. Number eight. Well, look at that. I mean, come on. It's going to kind of cruise the river. It's going to kind of swoosh like that. And it probably, say it goes like that. Passes through, the, creates that swamp for exiting out into the ocean, which I suppose I could you know, put a little marks to make sure we remember that this is ocean. There we go. That was number eight. We need number nine. Four hills, canyons, and mountains. Uh, see, I don't know. You know, things I don't know how to do. I don't know how to move. Oh, that's making it big. How do I move this around? No, no. All right. So I'm gonna put. I will put kind of a canyon. No, what should I do? What should I do? What is this? That toggle show show the grid. I've got that. Can I make it bigger? Okay, not sure how to do that. All right, we'll just stick with hills then, just to make it easy. But I probably would have put a canyon in there just to mix it up. Finally, number ten. Hills, canes, and mountains. Come on, give me something else. One, plains, grassland, farmlands. All right, I got that. No, that don't, I don't think that really reads as plains, grassland, or farmland, but that's what it is. Come at me if you can't take it. Then the last one, number 11. It just seems like it's probably going to be an island or something out there. It is. Wait, how did I get, oh no, seven, not 11, sorry, seven. Look at that, cliffs, beaches, and caverns. See, the dice provide. The dice provide. So we'll just wrap that in a little thing and we'll just put some. What can I put? Man, so you know, I've mentioned this before how often the dice just give you something. You never think they're going to give you what you need and then they give you. 
the grid is not relevant. It's just a drawing, just drawing guides, Brian Smith. Not relevant at all. No relevance at all. All right, so there we have it. And so I think you could easily see going through this process, and we could if we wanted to make it more hexy. We could hexify it up later. But no, the grid, the grid on here, it's just it's just Ouija giving me something. Not at all, nothing to do with that. So great, that was cool. We didn't get any far terrain, which is okay. Or, you know, I probably could have rolled far terrain for the island, for the number 11, but actually I got the same thing. So it didn't, actually didn't make any difference. Well, it did. I get C, which actually helps just as well. So C would have given me the same, basically, island. So it all worked out. Details. Each dot on the map is one detail. Details act as points according to the wilderness exploration rules. Keep in mind how many watches it might take to travel to each detail. The heart of the province is always a settlement. It isn't necessarily the largest or most important place people live, live but it does always have a significant history. Assume there are small villages scattered around larger settlements. These do not need to be represented by dots or details. Adding a detail. Roll on the settlements and settlement features tables to generate the heart of the province. Generate features for each of the remaining dots by first rolling on the detail types table, then on the associated table. For any additional settlements rolled, roll on the settlement feature table as well. All right, so the first one we'll do is for our settlement, our main settlement. Here, let me just do some little housekeeping. So here's our thing, and now I'm going to go over here. And I'm going to drop a list. Zoom in here. Whoop. We're going to have our part. Let's roll and see what kind of settlement we get. So this one, D6. I got a two. Ooh, it's a city. We got ourselves a city. Great. Go through, we'll call this details. Now we've got number two, crunchy frog, which we now will roll on the detail types. I got a five, that means it's a landmark. Oh, I suppose I should roll on these four detail features. Settlement features, just to go back one step. Six, it's lacking resources. Oh no, our poor city. City lacking resources. We will probably have to ask ourselves why at some point, but we're not concerned about that right now. Two was a landmark. What kind of landmark? Is there a landmark table? There is. That's a D12. All right, to the dice. D, what is that? That's a D10. Another D10. D12. All right. I got a three. So it's an ancient tree. Landmark. Tree. Roll it up again. Do we need to go back up here? Settlement. Oh, no, that's settlements. We need to go detail types. I got a five. That's another landmark. Oh, was I rolled the wrong? I got four of the sign of Misty Waterfall. Does that make sense for number three? Yeah, it could be. Maybe these hills come down and there's a waterfall. Or I guess there's no, well, we'd have to figure that out because there's no water there. It's not our main river area, but that's okay. There's elevation changes there, which we could probably work with. I forgot to put a landmark. Misty Waterfall. Now let's see, we've got, what else we got here? Another one. 
six prison. Does that have a sub table? Nope. The next one we have is a prison. Four prison. Five. You know, I'm just gonna refill these and just help make it a little bit faster. Six. I'm also cognizant of time. I don't want to get too wrapped up in this, but it shouldn't take me too long to get these filled out. Eight. Like that. Nine. And finally, 11. with asked if there's a way to do this all at once with the dice drop method maybe i have absolutely no room on my desk to do <laughs> to do that kind of dice drop you probably could figure it out probably could figure it out. i mean just for my purposes yeah if there was an auto automatic generator that would that would be awesome but it's good to go through the to see it every how everything works together the first time and then use the generators afterwards so now the next detail type is a number one which is a settlement again and it is a it is a sanctuary. Sanctuary that's rich in resources. Sanctuary. Oops. Sanctuary rich in resources. Good. Where does that end up? So that's number five. <laughs> oh, this is funny. So this is poor in resources, but our, our our town in the swamp here is rich in resources. We'll have some figuring out to do, but that's what I love about this stuff, getting all these things to figure out. And the next place is a two, which is ruins. Oh, good, because we didn't have any ruins yet. Ruins. Five, a dilapidated college, cottage. Ruins. Rapid. Yep. Cottage. And then the next one we need is a. Is that also ruins again? Yep. Another ruin. Stop rolling off the table. Oh. Three. We have a sunken thicket. Ooh, that's intriguing. Rooms. Sunken thicket. Yeah, please. All right, number eight. We've got what's three on the list? An outpost. Okay, just an outpost. It's an outpost. Post. Out to post, and then four is a hazard. We don't think we've seen a hazard yet, so this will be good. Another D6. The hazard is weak ground. Hazard. Round. Get a dice tray. You know, I want to get a dice tray, but I don't actually want to get one with like my logo on it or something, you know, be professional like. And yeah, I haven't done that yet. But yeah, I need a dice tray. I need a dice tray. I need a bigger working area and I don't have it. I think I mentioned on one of my, it might have been on the, I don't remember which stream it was that I'm in like a like three and a half by three and a half foot box, basically. So I have my my space is very limited. It feels like I'm, I'm sure to the audience at home, it's like I got endless space, but literally I can punch through a window that way. My bed's right over here, walls right behind me, and my other stuff is right in front of me. Don't have as much space it may appear because I'm standing in front of a wall or sitting in front of a wall. All right, where was I? Number 10. But yes, dice trays, more space. Yeah, you know. 
Or whatever we're all looking for. Number six. Six is ooh, I got a special. Here we go. This oh, this is a 20. I need the D20 now. Just put all the dice down and I need that D20. Oh, it came right out. All right, here we go. Five. Unusual gravity. Ooh. And the last one, we got one more. Here we go. Okay, place your bets. I rolled a two. Ruins. Right, well, that's kind of cool for the island that it's ruins. And it is an abandoned settlement. Which I like on the island. It's abandoned settlement. There we go. We've got our heart. I'll just put it as a settlement. City. So we have the, the heart of the place is a city that's lacking resources. We've got an ancient tree in these hills. We've got a misty waterfall down in these woods. We've got a prison in the hills over here. We have a settlement that's a sanctuary that's rich in resources, maybe something that they are able to get out of either the river, maybe the river is plentiful with fish and then there's stuff in the swamps or the whatever marshes that they live in, the wetlands, I guess. There's a dilapidated college over here in these cottage, in these uh, grasslands, or no, this is, sorry, oh, they're, they're in grasslands, my bad. I uh, see, I'm looking at them, forgetting my own symbols. Actually, the rich and resource settlement is in grasslands near a river, which actually makes a lot more sense. The dilapidated cottage is in the swamps, which also makes sense. See how this works, the dice just, Tell me, and I'm just not listening. Over here, we have a sunken thicket, maybe in a valley here in these mountains. We have an outpost of some type over here. In these hills, we've got weak ground. Maybe the ground gives way easily. Lots of rock slides, which also kind of makes sense. In these grasslands over here, there's something going on with unusual gravity. We'd have to figure that out. And then there's an abandoned settlement on this little island, this sandy island over here. So look at that. Everything working together. Eric calls it a pirate cove that's been conquered for now. Yeah, could be. Yeah, so, you know, everything's working together. That wasn't such a chore now, was it? Well, that was easy. All right, so now we can name our details, which I'm not going to do go through here, but I'll read the notes. Starting with the heart, name each detail on the map based on its unique terrain, feature, or history. Settlements are often named after their unique features, the shape of the river nearby or the large windmill in the town center. Then the residents add a noun or adjective. Windy Gulch, Black Tree Fort, Kitty Garden, etc. Wilderness and dangerous places are even more obvious. Poison Lake, greedy mines, etc. Some tell a story. Luca's Folly, Dead Man's Path, etc. Important places should have important names. That of heroes, religious or political figures, and important events. The Chalet of saint Ibiz, Queen's Harvest, Light of the Nine, etc. All right, so that's all good. On to factions. Factions rule over one or more details, an entire province, or even a domain. The map should reflect the impact of goals being completed or interrupted. Factions will work to complete their agenda independently. A faction may be governed by a powerful figure, but most of the time PCs will be dealing with their lieutenants or seneschals. Agendas and resources. Factions have agendas, three to four goals towards a clear objective, and the resources to help achieve them. Resources reflect a faction's influence, resources, wealth, and special features. Fact factions grow or lose their resources by trying to complete their agenda. I might say maybe to change that second with something like materials. Is that what we're talking about in this one? Influence, I'm getting materials, wealth, and special features. Is that way you just resources reflect the faction's resources. Factions grow or lose a resource by trying to complete their goals. Creating factions. Consider the detail and terrain you've developed. Note what is worth protecting as well as what is worth taking. Agendas are lofty plans with distinct steps based on actionable goals. They should relate to the acquisition of powerful territory, Weapons, money, and resources. Do not feel limited by the table results below. If something feels off on a, or a different table result would work better for your, your setting, use it. All right. So the procedure for creating a faction. Start with the heart. Roll on the faction types, the faction resources, and the faction agendas table for every settlement detail on the map. So I will just do a couple of these. Well, I think, let's see. How many settlements do I have? And I'm doing okay on time. I've got, uh, we've got one, one. 
two, just two, right? Am I reading that right? Yeah, so should, okay, so I'll, I'll do both of those. So the first one, for our heart, starting with the D12 table, that is nine. It's a military. And then we do, so we do type, resources, and agenda. So first, they're military. They're affluent, they're wealthy, and they they want domination. All right, so let's see where this is. Action wealthy military speaking domination. There we go. And then one more for the sanctuary. And that is, we'll go back here. So we're going to roll. Oh, I forgot. What is that? Ninth, what, 19? Oh, I rolled the 20 side die. I need the 12 side die. Why am I thinking? Ooh, that almost went to no man's land. I rolled a 10. These are nobles, seven, population, and ten again, revenge. So it's a, a populous nobility seeking revenge. I put the exclamation point there, but I thought it was, I thought it was warranted. Kind of interesting. So we have, you can see here, we already have some really nice tensions growing up. So here, our heart, that's got a wealthy military that's seeking domination. And oh, by the way, there's a city here, but it's lacking resources. Maybe because the fine resources over here are controlled by a nobility that is seeking revenge. Could it be that the military hunted out the the nobles and they came over here and settled down and now are not providing resources, have locked that off from the city? And so the city is now suffering, right? I mean, that's it's beautiful and it's just, just from a couple of rolls of the dice. Faction rules. By default, factions operate independent of the player character's actions. If the PCs do nothing, the faction should still achieve their own aims. Whenever a faction is positioned to advance a goal in their agenda, roll a d10 on the faction actions table. If two factions are opposed, the faction most at risk makes a will save using the score of its highest ranking at Seneschal. On a success, the, faction's most, the faction most at risk rolls on the faction actions table and their opponent does not. On a fail, the faction most at risk does not roll on the faction actions table, but their opponent Opponent does. And the actions, basically, they fail. They have a setback. The status quo is maintained. They have a mixed success. They succeed at something, or they have a, a major success. And then there are impacts depending on what they do. The actions of the PCs can always overrule the necessity for a faction action, or in some cases, provide an advantage of some kind to the role. And then, finally, we can name the province. Consider the following when determining the province name. What are the key geographic features of the region? What major event, war, famine, discoveries occurred here in the past? Who were the major players? What sort of factions have historically dominated this place? A name may also include a reference to the region's relative position to the seat of power, the Northeast Redoubt, Western Ranges, etc. First, the name, first or family, of a discoverer, conqueror, or colonizer often sticks around long after their death. Yes, Amerigo Vespucci, we are looking at you. Conclusion, congratulations, your province is complete. You can now drill down into various locations, starting with the heart, and build out each detail on your own favorite tables. Keep the following thoughts in mind as you go. How might the interactions between the factions interact with the landscape, its features, and one another? How will this change as the faction, factions succeed or fail at their goals? Consider the history of the region's original discoverers, quote-unquote, the locals they may have supplanted, supplanted, and where both groups are today. When building out the next province, keep in mind how it would have inter interacted historically with this province and what might happen between them in the future. If you find anything amiss, there aren't enough towns to feed a city so large or wrong, why is there a frozen graveyard in this hot wasteland? Feel free to change it or add your own details. Remember, it's your setting. 
the absolutely CCC. All right. And look at that, 50, 52 minutes in. So we got a few minutes left. So here we went through, and I and I think, so remember I mentioned Yochai did a video that outlines this whole dot thing. I don't think it's that complicated, even though I got a, a little bit wrong. So keep that in mind if you watch this later. I think, and I corrected myself. I did catch myself in my mistake. But I think you end up with a really nice, yeah, kind of point, point crawl style map. We got some interesting terrain. And like I say always with the dice, you end up getting stuff. I feel like that kind of works. It makes sense. And now, granted, it's not always going to be the case. Yeah, you can have with the frozen, frozen, uh, what was it? The the frozen something in the hot, in the hot wastes kind of thing. But I think we got a lot. Of the only one that might be a little bit, might have to finesse a little bit is the misty waterfall. But even then, I think that could work. There's some, we got things coming out of the mountains. There's probably another river here that maybe is just not that big that comes flows through here. And we got our, we got our mist, we got our misty, misty waterfall. And uh, we got two factions so far, one around the heart. And I like that they're already is kind of a ready-made conflict. The wealthy sanctuary that wants revenge, maybe against this military that's looking to dominate, potentially kick them out. But now they're being frozen out of a lot of the resources. Here are all the great grasslands that the nobles control. This swamps is probably not very nice since that abandoned cottage probably hints that people had settled there and are no longer there. Maybe that keeps them from getting to these grasslands out here, which of course also have a weird gravity effect. So making it hard to get a hold of those resources when you start to farm and all your stuff goes flying into the air because gravity doesn't work right. And then maybe there was this pirate issue going on here. Maybe the military defeated the pirates for the moment, but who knows? They could return. So good stuff. With that out of the way, you can get into the example setting just to see what stuff that Yochai came up with. So the theme in this example setting, where's the name of your setting, Yochai? The land of exemplar. Theme, low magic. Magic is known but rarely understood. Technology is 13th or 14th century. Gunpowder, longbows, some agricultural innovations, pre-printing pre -printing press. Religion exists, but it's murky and unprovable. Deities do not necessarily walk the lands, though some believe that they do. PCs are human only and are neutral toward the center, towards the centers of power. Names and proper nouns are largely plain English. Themes are inspired by the British Isles, Germany, and Eastern Europe. The scale of this domain is one pro small is one province under a single ruler, the potentate. And then the terrain we have, the results of the die rolls are below. Items in bold represent the chosen terrain. So the hub, we've got uh, oasis, forest, cliffs, cliffs, beaches, sea, hills, sea, swamp, waste on the caverns. And the details, the central hub is a stronghold, which is the seat of the government. There's an, oh, they he, look at that. He got an unusual gravity, too. Hazard, permanent fog, an abandoned settlement, a glimmering cave, a trash heap, faction hideout, prison, a home of the folk witches, a, another faction hideout, and a hidden burrow. And the names, Hope Landing, the Drifting Wood, the Merc, Dead Margin. Ooh, I like that, Dead Margin. That sounds like a movie, like a neo-noir movie from the 80s. Uh, you know, I can see something. William Hurt in Dead Margin. Oh, okay. There's the name. Of it. It's called White Fort. Thank you. All right. So we had so the Dead Margin, Swift Mine, Slag Harbor. Ooh, Slag Harbor is good too. Lord's Blanket, Whisper Box Isle, Hexmire, Prius Promise, and the Skunk Holes. I think that's some kind. Of, feels like that's like a hillbilly clan from some kind of cartoon. Like you know, uh, Daring McDuck. Fights against the skunk holes. The province is called White Fort. White Fort, after its quote unquote founding by the great ancestor of the Earl of White, the now dead locals referred to it as the Ramparts, but that name is long forgotten. The heart of the province is Hope Landing, built around a large font of water in an otherwise brackish land, and originally acted as a hub for future explorers and pioneers traveling throughout the region. After years of stymied exploration in the wastelands of the West, folks eventually settled in the capital city. Current ruling faction, the potentate, makes the city the center its center of government, while the will hides in the abandoned town of Dead Margin on the cliffs to the southwest. So the factions that we've got are the potentate, which is the ruling government. Their base is at Hope's Landing. The uh, they are they are somewhat anonymous. The ruling council speaks only through an anointed subject that's called the Whisper. Knowledge: There is little the potentate's ubiquitous spies do not know. They have authority as the ruling faction over the province. Detachments of soldiers can be summoned from the villages very quickly. Their seneschals are the Whisper, with the stats as a Banshee, and Lord Axie, who stats as a Buccaneer. Their agenda is to maintain the stability of the realm by crushing rising threats from other factions. 
They will deploy newly garrisoned troops to all roads leading into the capital to uncover enemies of the realm through torture and force, and they will crush the will and any other enemies threatening the realm. And their obstacles, the opposition, which is the will, who directly defies the rule of law. Aaron says, double dead margin and a double feature with faction action. There you go. Or faction Jackson. How about that? The Earl of White is a noble. It's based at Hope's Landing. The fealty of the Plains Villages and their farms. Property. The White family has control of significant food stores. The Seneschal, their personal chamberlain. Their agenda is to increase their own wealth by eliminating Lord Alexi or Alexi. Promised this season's crop yield to the Underfolk in exchange they will raid nearby villages. That's not very nice. They want to bait and assassinate Lord Alexi, whose family owns the Swift Mines, and then marry the widow Alexi and inherit the mines or buy them at a steep discount. Their obstacles, cloak and dagger. If the Earl's plans are discovered, there will be nowhere he can hide. And then we got Underfolk who come from the skunk holes. They, uh, they're kind of stat up as kobolds and their rat-like apparatus, the God Thumb, which provides warmth and safety. They have a senes Seneschal as Karo. That's his net. And their, their agenda is to protect the God Thumb at all costs, find new sources of food for the coming winter, Ally with the Earl of White for his food store, so long as it is convenient, and then find an independent food store that they may control. The obstacle is doggy dog. Other factions want the God Thumb as well. And then finally, the will, the resources, the, their base is a dead margin, and the remnants in remnants in Freya's promise. He's got two D10 plus 10 acolytes. The, their position is a spring house and abandoned keep in dead margin that was once used by the ancestors of the Earl of White. To imprison and torture their political enemies, it is well fortified and contains a small complex of jails beneath it. Seneschal is Aryan von Volson, who stats as a lich. Whoa. And their agenda is to acquire the God Thumb and use it to restore Freya the Empty, then rule the provinces. Send spies throughout the provinces in search of the God Thumb and then steal it. Command the Underfolk to overwhelm the capital and distract the potentate. Take the God Thumb to Hexmire and bathe it in the font of regret. Their obstacle, the consequences are dire. The potentate will find and kill them all. And then finally, we get the map. We can see how Yochai's map turned out. There's the one that's off. Remember, at the end of this whole thing, you're supposed to have one that's not connected. There's that one over there. Otherwise, here is the heart and everything else. Dashes for trails, lines for roads, forest, like canyon or cliffs. This is, uh, is this more canyon? This may be canyon. This is... It's maybe ocean or is this more canyon? Not sure. And we have hills. I think that's maybe swamp. More hills. And you can see it's a, it's just a rough map. It's better looking than mine. They, they got a nice lake there too. And there you have it. So I think you can see from this. I mean, I really like it. It's very, very well set up. Simple. Get you started. It obviously links in with a lot of other resources for Cairn, which is awesome. And I appreciate that there are sort of internal leaks, so to speak, links so to speak, to get you in all the different spots. So you can read up on more of the stuff to build build it up. I like the layout of the provinces, the way of thinking about it. I've been doing kind of something similar. Uh, I don't. I think I might even use the term province, but I'm doing it slightly differently because the, the thing I'm working on is more hex-based as opposed to kind of point crawl-based. But it's the same kind of thing you see in all, all things like birthright. These are just ways of laying out these kind of governmental units, kind of how to how to think about it, right? And then I, I like the uh, I like the I like the coming up with the details, and I think as Frederick said before he left earlier on, you could easily mix some of the stuff in with your players to make it really a joint world building exercise if you want to, where everyone can kind of have a turn putting stuff on the map and rolling the dice together and coming up with some of those details to really get sort of a unique experience that you've all had a hand in. But super great stuff. Thanks, Yohai, for putting this out there into the world. Uh, I've put the uh, the link in here in the chat at the beginning of the stream. You can also find it in the show notes. Anything else before I uh, call this one? Call this one a stream. Any last questions, comments, everything else? I'm trying to think if there's anything I would want to add to this. I don't really think so. I mean, I, I'm I'm sure if, as I keep keep if I were to keep going through and building up my thing here, I might mix and match some stuff. But of course, that's always not only allowed, but encouraged, as you should always do. If you have a tool that links in or you like better or just works great that's not part of these tools, just add it in. Make it your own, as they say.
All right, doesn't seem like anyone's got anything left. You can see my nice settlement. Uh, maybe I'll do something with this. Uh, I, the one thing I'm wondering, I wonder if it's under special, because just in terms of, let me just look up a little bit here. In terms of something like, because I could see using this really with like a Gygax 76 approach. Because I think one of the things that's harder with the Gygax 76 is building out that map. Because it's kind of like, oh yeah, this week you're going to build out your map. And I think that's where a lot of people can be like, ah, I'm not sure what to do. Try to find other resources. This is a great way to kind of get that area out there. And I kind of like that at the in the way they're doing here, we're not really concerned about the distances so much. Hey, it's near, hey, it's far. And then you, you can kind of figure all that stuff out later. You can take your roughly drawn map that you come from here, take it into hexographer or worldographer, take it into your mapping of choice, or just then make a nicer or different kind of hex map about it. Um, the only thing I would say, like if you're going to use something like that is, I don't think there's anything here. For, I was just going to look at the details. Well, I guess ruins. So I was thinking about, well, where is your dungeon, right? And Guy X 76 was like, here is your kind of main dungeon. So you might want to pick one. I would say that maybe if you were going to do this and say a Gygax 76 or other approach where you want to specifically have a dungeon, take that one. Remember we said there's always going to be one dot that is not connected to everything. In my case is here. Take that and turn that into your dungeon. So in this case, I would take this ruined abandoned settlement and I'll, like, I'll just make a note here. Dungeon. Call that your dungeon. And then he just Everything kind of else-wise works together. The gas against says that the faction reaction chart could be tweaked to a 2d6 bell curve. If you want, I mean, the advantage of the 2d6 bell curve or any kind of bell curve, right, is that certain certain other results are weighted. You're more likely to get results in the middle than you get on the edges of the probability. Do you want that for these things? Or at least to start, do you just want them to have kind of equal opportunity to be anything? I think during the game, you could just use whatever reaction rules you're using. Um, you know, do you want to have that? But here, there kind of is. Well, this is a D12, but they're kind of, I guess everything is just, it ends up being kind of one and six. There's with two chances of everything. But yeah, sure. You can use whichever method of probabilities that you like. 2D6, though, I think technically is, I've been told, is not actually a bell curve, though it's approaching a bell curve. I guess you need to get the 3D6 for a real, real bell curve. But that's beyond my mathematical knowledges. But yes, you can obviously tweak tweak these numbers however you see fit. But a very, very solid, great way to prompt. What we do is we need one of these. We need one of these for uh, for Dungeon 23. Yo, hi, Gal, you, if you had gotten this out when like Gygax 76 was at its peak, I think it would have helped a ton of people out. <laughs> Ian says it's more of a symbol curve. Could be more of a triangle curve. Always need more triangle. Christopher says that 2d6 gives you a pyramid curve. 3d6 gives a pretty good bell curve. Yeah, I don't know technically what they call it, but I, so I, I know I've been corrected once in the past and I always remembered it as that 2d6 is not a true bell curve. I presume they said it with authority, so I assume that they're correct. I'm not claiming to know myself. That's just what they told me and I bought into it. So if I'm wrong, somebody somebody can correct me. Well, thanks again, Yohaigal, for uh, throwing this out there and thanks for hanging out in the chat as I fumbled my way through at least parts of it. Really good resource if you're looking to create a setting. If you're looking to create a setting to go with your dungeon, Dungeon 23, or just to go with your game in general, you're looking for a set of prompts. I really like this approach. Not that I dislike or that I no longer like the approaches in like Worlds Without Number, but this is kind of a different way, a more of a little bit loosey, loosey-goosey way than the very much more rigid structural approach to something like Worlds Without Number. I think some people are going to gravitate towards that style is working for them. And I think this will, a lot of people gravitate towards this style. I think they both work really well. It's just pick the one that works for you. Anyhow, that's all I've got. Everybody have a great rest of your day, night, whenever you end up watching or listening to this game on. And I will talk to you later. Bye now.